So what I'd ask, so we know Pierre. So what I'd say is we'll kick off with you, Simon. So if you could introduce yourself and then explain what you do in this space. Okay. So I'm, I'm Simon. I founded Simwood back in 96 as the world's first global gateway between the internet and mobile phones, which both look like they might catch on. Um, we've been about a while, uh, had APIs since before those APIs, and done various other things for, for, for a long time. But we've been a, a voice provider's carrier since um, probably about 2005. Um, in, this, in this particular space, we've researched and published on um, VoIP fraud since the early 2000s. And there's dozens and dozens of hours on YouTube of me waxing lyrical about how it all how it all works and if anybody's interested in a free book we've got you know the, the th things on it um, but more recently we've been in the space of what I would call intelligent minutes um, so we're providing services to um, obviously the traditional carrier carrier space but increasingly what I'd call post service provider enterprises enterprises that are so sophisticated they don't need a service provider and the financial community is a massive, massive part of that. So we're very fortunate to be in the pipeline um, whereby where 60% of the world's credit card transactions get screened. And more significantly, we're directly involved in the US and Western Europe in combating fraud against the fraud mitigation systems. Um, there was previously an assumption that the voice channel and the SMS channel were secure. And uh, banks in particular are waking up to the realization that they're not. So in real time, we're providing some measure of, um, measure of trust and verification on, on calls into and out of um, the enterprise based on the unique signaling access that we have as a, as a carrier data feed similar to uh, yeah, uh, talked about and relationships. Hi, my name is Thomas Howe. I design communications products, um, and I'm the founder and CTO of, of 10-Digit Communications. And my, my interest has been in um, pushing our art forward and designing products for the first time. So um, I do. Hi, uh, Todd Carruthers here, I'm Chief Revenue Officer of Counterpath. Uh, some of you in the uh, VoIP community may have heard of a product called Xlight. That's us. We have over uh, 20 million clients that have been downloaded, deployed, uh, and uh, been doing it now for almost 17 years. Counterpath has, not me, but um, almost 17 years, uh, 11 years for me. But um, so we, we started in that space, a lot of early on work in the um, ITF around standardization of SIP compliant uh, uh, soft phones, things like that. Uh, today, though, it's not really so much about the, the cell phone itself. It's more about collaboration and um, those type of products, uh, particularly targeted towards the open source market or those that have taken an open source platform and want to build something that can uh, compete from a services perspective with the likes of uh, Cisco and others out there um, on a services level. So that's what, um, that's, what, that's what I represent and that's where I'm coming from. And I really enjoyed your presentation, Pierre. I thought it was great because I'm not on that side of it at all. I'm on the endpoint side of it. So uh, those things are, are not really, you know, in, in our kind of bellywick of concern on a, on a daily, daily basis. So I really enjoyed it because I did learn a ton there. Uh, our kind of where we come from in this whole discussion is simply from the endpoint side, which is um, a lot of these things that, that, that uh, Pierre talked about are kind of thought about already. And by the time it gets to us, it's we got to make sure that we have a, uh, you know, an endpoint that can't be hacked and, and uh, if it can be hacked, you know, uh, what data is available there uh, to those that do hack it? And then um, how does it get distributed down to, to you know, millions of users and then connect into the service and things like that? So we're more in the kind of, the, you know, physical layer of things and, and, then, and then upward um, to the application side where, where things like in the signaling TLS is really important, SR3P, those standard-based, uh, you know, older technologies that are just uh, kind of proven out kind of um, come into play. We also do a lot in the MDM and EMM space in terms of working with vendors as a way of, of security and 
privacy um, and, and also to, to fight against fraud as well. So that's another area that we really, um, uh, you know, kind of play with, uh, you know, the, the likes of uh, good Blackberry, Citrix, AirWatch, and others like that. Um, but for us, it's, it was interesting because for us, yeah, we're very, it's very different because we're really focused around uh, kind of the, the endpoint side and not some of the, the, the schemes behind it that you, you highlighted, which I thought were great to hear. Cool. Thanks so much, Todd. Because as you know, was said, well, by Thomas several times, it's always an end-to-end -end solution. Yeah. So that's why I was keen we had you, know, you all on there. So looking at, you know, businesses now are integrating more and more workflows thanks to programmable telecoms. So we now got across the PBX or UC. We're, you know, we're seeing a lot of these platforms exposing capabilities. I'm just interested from each of your perspectives on where you see some of the emerging battlefronts in fraud, given the space that you're in. So I'll start with you again, Simon, because you've written the book. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, fraud is different things to different people. Um, I mean, I think Pierre covered three aspects that, that they, they deal with. We deal with two of those three. The one that we um, you know, validate identity, potential customers. The, the two that we do are um, toll fraud, which frankly, if there wasn't such a level of um, apathy at a technical level amongst the ITSP and carrier community would have been solved 20 years ago. Um, the data's there, the mechanics are there, people just need to give a toss when they equipment, frankly. Um, we provide all the tools on the back end to contain the damage when they don't do that. Um, the, probably the most quoted phrase in my email is, I must do something about implementing your fraud controls. That always proceeds somebody being woken up on Christmas Day because they've been compromised. But as, as a business, we can tell them they're going to be compromised now a couple of months in advance of it, of, of it happening. Um, because the indicators of toll fraud are there long before what people would normally consider to be the actual toll fraud. And when you look at the data, we've got donkey's years of hot data now. When you look at that and analyze it, it really comes down to about 20 numbers that uniquely know and block on, block on the network. As new ones crop up and hit the honeypots, we, we block those network-wide immediately. So maybe famous last words, but toll fraud is, is a is a problem that shouldn't be a problem for people that, that care about it. Um, the, the emerging threat, the, the second aspect that, that we look at is, is financial fraud, and that is rather like trying to nail jelly to a wall. Um, we do lots of the, the stuff that Pierre talked about in detecting SIM swap and that kind of thing. I suspect we're doing it in a, in a slightly different way in different, different um, geographies. But, we do other things that, as, as a carrier um, because we have access to data such as porting, porting fraud and user location and, 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 and things like that. But the emerging one and the scary one to my mind and the one that we're, we're battling hard with is what I would call the back-end intercept. Um, so I can go on the dark web sometime this evening, go in a chat room, and I can guarantee within probably five or ten minutes, aside from the people offering me stolen credit cards, somebody will be offering me a back-end intercept. And for those of you that, that don't know what this is, all of the mobile phone networks are, are connected via a protocol called SS7. They need to be connected to enable you to hop off a plane and service provider query your home service provider and see if you can, you can have service. Um, via manipulation of some of that data behind the scenes, which you can do um, with simply access to, to the protocol and tightening but still lacks security standards at, at some of the operators. Effectively, for $200, somebody can man in the middle your mobile number and have all of your calls and all of your SMS unencrypted with you completely unaware of it. Um, so unlike SIM swap, where you might realize that you've got no phone service half an hour after you've lost all your money, with the back-end intercept, you've got no idea it's, it's, it's going on. This is widely used in espionage circles, has been for, for donkey's years, but it is now commoditized for use in financial fraud. So for $200, you can own somebody's mobile identity, and that has an ROI if they've got more than $200 in the bank account that you've also compromised. And Todd, 
just interested in uh, you know, from an endpoint perspective, yes. what you see as some of the, the emerging battlefronts. Yeah, I mean, from an endpoint perspective, yeah, I kind of gave perspective. a... Go for the endpoint guy. Yeah, so I, I gave a little bit of a, you know, my intro, but, um, you know, we obviously just, we, on the mobile network or whatever network you're on, uh, for us it's all about VoIP, so if it doesn't have a VoIP connection, we don't really apply because um, that's what we do. Um, and luckily in VoIP is no fraud. Just kidding. Um, there's tons of fraud. And it actually, um, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's really around making sure that, um, and where our customers focus on, is making sure that the user that enters credentials are entering credentials for them and making sure that that is them. And so uh, we, um, and how we handle it is we have a, a provisioning server that connects directly to our clients and um, authenticates the clients and also works with other databases that the customers manage through a secure interface as well. Uh, and in many cases through um, uh, Microsoft uh, Active Directory too, depending on how they want to deploy. But for us, that's, that's kind of the key uh, component of it because as we all know, uh, if, you know, the, the VoIP providers uh, won't give you SIP credentials typically, like the large, especially consumer base, like Comcast. Um, so our customers don't want to do that either, so they want to make sure there's a provision down and that the, um, that the fraudsters don't get access to it. So for us, we, we manage that uh, through the endpoint to um, a provisioning server, typically ours. Um, that's that's um, highly secure. Excellent. Thanks. I want to skip over the robocalling. We'll come back to that one. But because you talked about provisioning and auto-provisioning. I was just interested, you know, mobile phones becoming SIP endpoints for corporate networks. You know, it's VPN out. Um, so with auto-provisioning, is there new hybrid fraud, ma fraud management risks, you know, like proxy user authentication? I don't know whether it's too glib a question. Can you reframe the question? You've said the question. Yeah, yeah. I've just seen, um, you know, I was reading an article around sort of, uh, you know, hybrid fraud management risks and, you know, it was talking around like sort of, you know, proxy user authentication when you have auto provisioning, you know, because quite often that's just left on, you know, it's just there. So you basically sort of, you know, it automatically registers. So you, you can be intercept that, you know, if you put, you know, I, I can't remember the uh, exact details. So I might be sort of being a bit glib on this, but, uh, you know, again, I guess we'll skip over that if I if just I, ramp. I, I can say something on yeah. auto provisioning if you want, because it's something I've banged on about for the best part of 10 years. Um, auto provisioning relies on the fact that you, you, know, you, you plug a phone in and it makes a call home. It makes a call home with its, with its MAC address, which is in theory a global unit identifier. Um, the, the manufacturer then redirects that to a provisioning server for the ITSP that happens registered that, that MAC address. The problem with that is, is, is many-fold. A MAC address isn't a globally unique identifier. They're, alloc they're allocated in, in blocks to, to manufacturers. They then sub-allocate them by product. So if you know which phone a particular ITSP tends to deploy, you can get reason a reasonably close guess to the sequential block of MAC addresses they're going to be, they're going to be using. Um, furthermore, different vendors have different levels of competence on this, and some of them have caught up in, in recent years, but it's fair to say most of them are well, well below where they, where they should be. Where they do use encryption, in many cases, if you cut the firmware, the certificates, are, the certificates are there, but in a lot of cases, they don't use encryption. So, and furthermore, these auto-provisioning servers tend to be boxes in a corner of an ITSP's network that sit there serving out config, and nobody really, nobody really monitors them. So long story short, a script kiddie can compromise auto-provisioning and download effectively credentials for an entire ITSP's customer base with a relative degree of ease. Yeah, and, and maybe not so much um, on proxy-based or proxy authentication, but one of the things that, that you know, uh, is very critical to, to our deployments is because we are a soft phone, um, uh, uh, you know, like Simon just mentioned, a lot of provision servers are kind of forgotten about. We've seen that actually, which surprised the heck out of us. Because for us, you know, being that we're software, we're very dynamic. We have over 600 settings in our phone that can be um, adjusted, and it's getting, it's growing every day um, for us. And so every time you log in, you actually get an XML bundle from our provisioning server that changes the settings depending on what the IT organization uh, has done. So that's kind of one point. The other point is is that. Uh, for us, you know, um, we absolutely uh, do um, uh, certain, under deployment models, uh, it will change depending on what customers we deal with. 
So sometimes, we mentioned Nigeria earlier, sometimes we have customers that are in, in areas that have a lot of uh, fraud issues and things like that, and there's a bunch of places all over the, issue, over the, over the world, um, but we'll actually, uh, we will redirect the provisioning uh, to different provisioning servers and actually pretty much do a forward across these different servers so that we can intercept them. Okay. So that, that if there is an issue and we see something that is um, inflated, because we'll see that all of a sudden on our, on our provisioning side, a bunch of transactions happening, we'll get an alarm and then we can kind of okay. go investigate gotcha. that kind of thing. Okay, that's clear. That's clear. Because that sort of overlaps with the last question around, you know, from the VoIP world, there's just been so many processes that have been implemented that, you know, mitigate a lot of the risks. I mean, like I mentioned here, in terms of prepay or as near real-time billing as you can get so that you can basically sort of trigger. So, again, with the auto-provisioning, what you're seeing is you're monitoring this so in near real-time, as soon right. as you see a spike, you can react to that. So that's cool. So do we have any questions from the audience? If not, I'll just finish on the one I skipped over, which is robocalling. It's fashionable, the shake and stir. But again, I'm just interested in your perspective. Do you see your solutions uh, as being a way you can help your customers in mitigating illegal robocalling or maybe semi-legal robocalling? Because Eric pointed out that there are providers out there. that. So, yeah, go for it. Anybody got a comment on that? I have that. So, so I actually had, I had one, one thing around that, and it, I think um, uh, as you may have heard my first talk around smartphone design, one of the, the hangovers that um, you can see from our landline legacy as we move to smartphones is in the way we actually use the phone, and what you may have noticed when you use a smartphone is you text each other first usually, and the texting is the precipitate to the call. <clears throat> we have a text-first model. And um, I think one of the reasons why robocalls are even a thing is because we've accepted for quite a while that people can just call you without the messaging that normally applies to you talking to a friend. So, you know, uh, I guess the point is, this might be an example of how this is a symptom of just a bad call model one day then it actually is a long-term problem that we have to solve. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Raise your hand. Hi, sir. Straight back. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, Dinesh. I asked this before from Pierre on the whole uh, burner phones. Um, one of the challenges is, you know, what happens when you have uh, number portability now in many of the Asian countries, you know, your number portability. How would you uh, handle that from a, because now it's, number is not with the same career it was, you know, it can be with multiple. Fraud, from a fraud standpoint, you know, like, like it's similar to burner phones or same soft phone. Again, that's thousand. Not only a question. And you. Yeah, yeah. They're not picking up your audio. Could you just get a bit closer? Oh, yeah. So b before reaching that point, we'll probably have a RCS solution yeah. fully launched and with other type of attribute help capturing of his. 
but it will never be 100. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting hearing about SIM swap in, in a US context, because I tend to regard SIM swap as a, as a European and an Asian phenomenon. And when I consider its equivalent in the US, I actually think of porting, because I think the porting process is, is probably, well, one positive is very efficient, but another, the corollary of that is, is open, to, open to abuse. In terms of how we um, identify that, um, we're now a licensed carrier in the US, so we have access to various databases. So it's fairly trivial. Just as with SimSwap, you would try to determine when the IMSI associated with a certain phone number or the SIM associated with a certain phone number last changed. It's no different with porting. When did this number last port? And if it's two hours ago, and as Pierre said, there's a whole lot of other indicators that, that squeaky bottoms, um, then you're going to be... Um, more suspicious about that, that call or that transaction. On robocalling, um, I like being controversial, um, but I'm also going to be complimentary. Um, in the US, you don't have a problem. Um, and the reason I say that is that I suspect you're only seeing about 25% of the robocalls you would otherwise see if the carriers over here and the regulatory environment over here hadn't done such a lot of work. So, and, and the basis for that opinion is that we've come from the European market into the US. We have European ways of, of working as a carrier. We have European standards around call, call quality and things. Coming into the US market with the same global financial customers as we have in Europe, we have traffic that looks like dialer in some cases. So if, if a bank is calling you to query a credit card transaction or to perform collections, they tend to be short duration calls. There tends to be a high volume of them. All of the indicators that, that point to bad robocalls are very similar with this good traffic. And the controls in place across the various carriers from from penalties in place on, um, on contracts for, for kind of global aggregate traffic statistics, right the way down to intercarrier um, blacklisting of numbers that have exhibited bad behavior, right the way through to stir shaken and other things that are happening at, you know, at, a, at a higher level to, to combat this, aren't, in my experience, happening anywhere else. In the UK and in Europe, there are none of those contractual restrictions. There are none of those mandated um, top-down um, controls. We need them. We'd welcome them. Um, but, you know, compliments to the FCC and the carrier community over here. You guys are well ahead of the curve, even though it may not feel that way as consumers getting annoyed by these things. That's interesting. Thanks for that, Simon. Yeah, no, appreciate that. And, Thomas? Uh, yeah, just one endpoint perspective on, on fraud. And because I think it's kind of a funny uh, use case, but it's real. Uh, so uh, we've been working on smartphone designs to enable sports betting for outdoor events. And part of the problem with sports betting is um, people all in the audience tend not to download the mobile application, so you want to use the phone itself to make a bet. And um, you have to validate that the person making the bet is old enough to make the bet. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, it's a good example of that kind of number fraud when the kid takes the father's phone to start betting on the Jets. And so, so um, this is actually a small use case of many larger use cases of, of fraud, not at the transaction level, but at the impersonation level. I'm signing a contract. I'm, I'm pretending to be you in a workflow, et cetera. Uh, and, and the things that we found that actually make, make a little bit of difference around it are to look at some of the fundamentals that the phone number can provide to you, like Pierre's talk adequately really you know, put together, but also things like biometrics. Take a picture of your face, take a picture of your license, send them in, do they match? Send me in another selfie if, if too much time has gone on, et cetera. And that's, and that's uh, again, I think it's a, a funnier version of, of number fraud, the kid, but <laughs> I mentioned. Yeah, but where there is such strict penalties around underage betting, I mean, that's a great right. example where it's right. so simple. 
Yeah, and, and, and by the way, if you're, if you're outside this country, it is a thing. It's, it's going to happen. Every, every major league has their lawyers fighting for their percentage of it. And it's in-game betting, basically. Yeah. You know, who's yeah. going to get the next score? That demonstrates why context is so critical. This Indeed stuff. so. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Do we have anything else from the audience? Oh, go for it. <clears throat> Just to follow on your, uh, you had it, you call it robocalling. So, um, and I agree with you, Simon, that, you know, here we've got less robocalls than you'd expect because a lot of, you know, things going on. Um, I think what we get is a lot of people who go onto a website and, or, you know, make something online and then that company and 15 other companies, you know, start calling you, right? And that's, you know, kind of, not really for fraud purposes, they're trying to get some business, right? But the one thing that we didn't really talk about is how do I, um, since I can't block an SMS from a VoIP number that doesn't exist, <laughs> right? So basically, an SMS robocall. How do you block that baby? <laughs> right? Because I do get them. <laughs> right? Oh, they come in point. from some number that is not an actual end number, and it says, you know, this system called me, and it's not for me. Yep. <laughs> right? The text tells me this. So how do you block that one? I get an SMS from a number that is not an actual real phone number. Well, it's not a real person. There's some sure. bot that's yeah. pumping out, like you know, asking you to click on some URL, you know, from the yeah. You know, it's just yeah. But it could be a sim box that's just pumping out so stuff to get. Uh, yeah. It could. It could. Yeah. It's just. It, it's basically a voice over IP type PBX yeah. that doesn't have actual real no numbers behind it. It's got a whole bunch of numbers buried in it that are not recognizable as country codes, etc. To, to your point about um, you can falsify CLI on a vo voice call, but you can't on an SMS. Um, that's that's not actually correct. You spoof the originator on an SMS just easily, and certainly in Europe, um, we have alphanumeric originators. So a lot of the um, spam SMS that we'll get won't come from a number at all. It will come from PPI claims, whatever. Um, and that's untraceable other than from the, the carrier. You can't even reply to it because it, you can't respond to an alphanumeric destination. Um, since I've hogged the mic again, I'll, I'll, I'll go answering the, answering the question. Um, where for, for our customers, we're in the pipeline of calls into an, uh, the, the network and able to use signaling intelligence to provide metrics around those. We do exactly the same with SMS. Okay. Anything else from anybody else? If not, no, that was a great question. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Go for it. So, Simon, I, I just want to, um, I guess, maybe elaborate a little bit on what you said about. Um, what's going on here in the U.S. to combat robocalling and what you see in other markets around the world. So do you, it's a, a kind of a two-part question. One is, do you suspect that there's not much uh, work then to combat robocalling elsewhere in the world because um, there are not targets as, that are as ripe elsewhere in the world? I guess that's question uh, number one. Or, or, or what else? So here in the U.S., there's a lot of public outcry about this. And if there's not elsewhere, that would maybe be one reason why there's not as much being done to combat it. And then the second part of that is, so if, if this is a U.S. solution, stir shaken, um, how successful is it going to be given the fact that it's not being implemented elsewhere? So there's a, there's a few questions wrapped up in there, um, Warren. Um, I think if you look at, I wouldn't say we get any less, any fewer robocalls, but I think culturally we're quite different. Um, in the UK, we might tut. Um, in France, they probably shrug their shoulders and set something on fire. Um, over here, you guys say something. Um, yeah, so there's, there's the cultural difference. If you, you look at the, the causes, um, you're a bigger market, you're a wealthy market, so would argue that that makes you a target. But in terms of the cost of propagating this, if you're actually paying for the phone call, it's cheaper to do so in the US than it is in 
in Europe, although that trend is changing as a result of the measures that are being put in place. And when I say it's changing, it's, there's an interesting thing when it comes to um, robocalls that if you stop the man in the street, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do a quick poll here. Do robocalls originate on VoIP or PDM? There's VoIP. Oh, are you scratching your head, Dean? Yeah. Who says TDM then? By definition, by implication, that's the rest yeah, of you. Everybody's saying TDM, yeah. Um, in the carrier networks, um, the VoIP networks tend to have these big, expensive SBCs that engineers don't have quite as much confidence in as they do the battle tested, steam powered TDM switch that's been there for 50 years and is you know, a bought and paid for asset on, on the balance sheet. So in terms of propagating these things, many of the big carriers actually sell the ability to pass traffic that would otherwise violate their own um, quality standards. They enforce those quality standards rigorously on the VoIP side of things. On the TDM side of things, they'll happily sell you a PRI to fill all day long with, with junk calls because it's bought, it's paid for, and they're going to charge you a higher rate for, for those calls because they know the type of, type of traffic it's, um, it's going to attract. To your other point, Warren, about um, stir shaken, um, we're, we're considering half of that in the UK, and my views on the UK regulatory regime are there in black and white on our blog for anybody to, um, to read, but to put it politely, they're a bunch of idiots. Um, half of stir shaken isn't particularly useful. Um, the whole thing is, and we're really looking forward to it in a fraud context, because just like Pierre was saying, the origin of a given of a, a call presenting a given CLI, which carrier interconnect it came over, is significant to us. If it suddenly comes in from a, an unexpected route, that's that's significant for us. Stir shaking is going to add an extra layer of, of um, certification to that that enables us to cascade that further beyond actually the immediately interconnected carrier. It's not going to help with internationally originated calls, um, but you would hope they would be filtered and identified by the, the carrier entering them onto the domestic, to the domestic network. So we still have a data point to do something there with. And I su suggest that with that, we thank the panel for an excellent discussion. Thanks a lot, guys. So that ends a long day. We've covered a lot. So uh, I believe the drinks will be there soon. So if we turn up there and we look thirsty, they'll bring the drinks out for us. Well, actually, I think we have to go into a little cubby hole to get our drinks and then bring them out, I think. Is that the procedure? So there is a procedure, but you now you know the process. Okay, guys? So again, thank you so much for staying to the end, and see you tomorrow.